Thank you very much. Thank you for that song. Thank you for the help. Thank you all for being here. Well, we have about half of us here, right? I could say half are gone, but half are here. That sounds a little better, I think. But thank you for being here. Thank you very much, each one of you. I appreciate it. I'd like to invite you where possible to kneel as we have prayer or bow your heads, please, where possible. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here in Kenya again. Thank you for the rain we had this afternoon. I'm sure it was a blessing to someone and I'm sure to us in some way. But Father, we have people missing and we'd like to have them here. But uh, put it upon their hearts that they need to be here if this is your will. And I pray that they'll listen to your spirit and help me to listen to your spirit to say just what needs to be said today, to not to not add to or take away from the word that you would have me share. Bless me with wisdom and understanding and discernment. Help me to speak clearly in a way that's understandable. And bless our congregation to have ears that they may hear. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Do you realize that after today, there's just three more days for camp meeting. After today, we just had three more days. This time has went by so fast. I've really appreciated my time here. I'm sharing some thoughts now on the three angels' messages, and this particular session will be on the second angels' message. We'll finish, hopefully, this study in the morning. We can't do it all this evening. Mm -hmm. And in the remaining time that I have, I want to talk about the third and the fourth angels' messages as well. But what we're looking at, friends, are just some, just some of the highlights, just some points, because these messages are so broad, so all-encompassing, that if I help you to understand anything, if I give you any kind of a lead in study, that's all it is. It's just a beginning. I would encourage you to go home and study these messages as if your life depended upon it, because it just might. The second angel's message found in Revelation chapter 14, 8. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The first angel's message tells us to fear God, amen? The first angel's message tells us to fear God, amen? The, the first angel's message also tells us to give glory to him, amen? The first angel's message also tells us to worship him, amen? And the second angel's message tells us to come out of Babylon, amen? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It just says Babylon is fallen. Very interestingly, in this message, friends, there is no call for action yet. It is simply a declaration of something that has happened. Now, of course, when we get to Revelation 14, or Revelation 18, 4, we're going to get a direct call. But as we studied the first angel's message, we saw that it was a separation message. We will see that the second angel's message also involves separation. Now, God, as we've mentioned, never brings destruction without first giving a warning. Before he brought the great flood, he commissioned Noah, a preacher of righteousness, to preach a warning message for 120 years. Before God destroyed Sodom, he sent two angels to warn anyone who would listen. Before the destruction of this world, God sent a message into the world. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 22, I want you to notice what we read here in verses 29 and 30. It says, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge 
and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. My brothers and sisters, today there has been a great breach made in the law of God. And God is calling for repairs of the breach. He's calling for men and women who will stand in the gap, if you please, and to, 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 to bring the hedge together, as it were. Where are we today? Do we have men and women who will do that? Who is Babylon? Who is this Babylon mentioned in Revelation 14, 8? And what has caused her to fall? What will be her judgment? And how can we come out of Babylon? Now, before the second angel's message is given, the first angel's message must be given and received. We noted in our last discussion that there were those who didn't receive the first angel's message, and therefore the second angel's and the third angel's message could be of no help to them. According to the first angel's message, we are living in the great day of atonement. The message of atonement was found in Leviticus chapter 16. It is the final atonement. It is the atonement of all atonements. And it was the only feast and I think I heard this said wrong earlier this week, but I may be wrong. Heard it somewhere recently. But it was the only feast that had a prohibition against work equal to the fourth commandment. There were there, there was certain types of work allowed on other feast days. But on the Day of Atonement, there was to be no work done of any kind. The children of Israel were to obey this or they were to be put out of the camp. And this was to represent to them the righteousness which comes from faith alone in Christ. All the works of Babylon are the works of man and not the works of God, and they run counter to God, and they run counter to his plans. Now let's go back to the very beginning, this concept of Babylon. To better understand modern mystical Babylon, we need to go back to ancient Babylon. Babylon's beginnings as told in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 to 10, it says, And Cush beget Nimrod. Nimrod began to be a mighty hunt, or a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kanad, in the land of Shinar. Nimrod was the first person in this world, to, to our knowledge, that accepted the title of king. And by this very act, displayed rebellion and defiance to God, who was the true king. Other rulers who had come before Nimrod simply claimed to be a viceroy. A viceroy is one who stands in the place of the king. It was commonly acknowledged that God was king. But now Nimrod says, no, I will be the king, and I will build a kingdom called Babel. And God acknowledged, friends, this, and he did something about it, didn't he? Now, Babylon was founded for two reasons. Firstly, the dwellers of the plain of Shinar disbelieved God's covenant that he would not again bring a flood upon the earth. That's in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 119 and um, page 119. Now, notice what was it, the reason that they built this, uh, this great tower? They disbelieved God's covenant. Now, oh, we've got a gad cometh, troop is coming. If I disbelieve, how else could I express not believing? or having disbelief. Say that again. How about this one? Not having faith. Not having faith, okay? In other words, if I don't have faith, that's the same as not believing, right? 
Secondly, Babylon was founded because of rebellion against God and his command to disperse. And I'm going to let these people come in, but we're going to be looking here at a text in Genesis 11 in just a minute. Genesis 11. Wow. They must have had a good class. Amen. They had a good class. We had a good class, too. We did have a good class. Sherry, would you bring up the water bottle? I'd like to have a drink while we're waiting on these people. There's a long line of them, so I'm going to give them a minute to get in here. For those waiting online, just be patient with us, please. And why, why they're coming in, I'll just speak to the people online. We have a few people on YouTube or somewhere. Good. Just speak to you folks online, letting you know that we're sorry you can't be here if you're in the Kenya area or somewhere in Africa and could have been here. Well, you should have been here. But I know there may be people listening in other areas who couldn't physically be here, but we're glad that you're here with us by spirit, and we appreciate that you've taken time to log in and to be with us. I really mean that. We still have a long line of people coming in. The room was only about half full when we started, and I think by the time these people get here, we're going to be pretty full. So we'll give them just a, a little bit more time, um, and then we'll get going here. But just to review, what was the first reason what was the first reason for their rebellion, for their building the Tower of Babel? The people, the plain of Shinar, disbelieved the promise of God. You remember the promise? He said, I will never flood the world again. He's going to create this, uh, he's going to recreate the world in a sense by giving it a chance to regrow and populate. And there'd be a rainbow in the sky and would tell us that he never again destroyed this world by a flood. Okay. Never said there wouldn't be a flood, but not a worldwide flood. Okay. Please come in if you're coming in. We'd like to get everything started. If you're coming in, please come in now. So we're going back to the to to the ancient Babylon. We're getting a historical basis for the concept of Babylon as we enter into the second angel's message here. And in Genesis chapter 11, verses 2, 3, and 4, and I'm sorry, I, I know there's people coming in. I excuse them if they're making noise coming in. But uh, those of us who are here already, I really need us, those of us who are here already, to stop talking, to be quiet, because I just can't concentrate. And it's not fair to the other people who want to hear to have me distracted and have your noise. Is that is that not unreasonable to ask of you? Thank you. Genesis 11, verse 2. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. God had told those people to disperse, but they are saying we're not going to disperse. They were in direct disobedience. They were in direct rebellion against God. Remember when we were studying about gospel order and we noted a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and says God is not the author of confusion, but that word confusion in the Greek, it means rebellion. It means defiance against authority. And this Tower of Babel was going to be the ultimate example of confusion and defiance against authority. God also told Noah's descendants to replenish the earth, Genesis 9-1. They were not to live in just one area. God's direction was to disperse, but instead, we read this in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 91. They built them a city and then conceived the idea of building a large tower to reach into the clouds that they might dwell together in the city and tower and be no more scattered. So again, we see there were two principles, a principle of unbelief and the principle of rebellion. And these are the very same principles that Babylon is today. The very same principles. Babel was a project begun in defiance to God, and it stood as a defiance to God. 
Now, in the Bible, the name Babel means confusion. Genesis 11, verse 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. If you'd asked one of the workers from the plain of Shinar, however, what that name meant, you would have gotten a different definition. I don't know if you know that or not, but to the builders of Babel, that name, to them, it signified the gate of God. Babel to them meant the gate of God. The inhabitants of Babel said that their city was the gate or the way to God. The route to heaven was through Babel. And even today, the leaders of mystic Babylon claim that Babylon is the gate of God. But friends, today, Babylon is no more the way to God than anciently Babel was to God. Even after God destroyed the Tower of Babel and confounded the languages of the people, causing many to scatter, the attractions of Babylon were still strong to the carnal mind, to those who do not have the glory and God first. The Israelites, if you remember one day, they went to fight against Ai. They had entered into the Promised Land under the leadership of Joshua, and they took the city of Jericho quite readily. But now they're going up against a little city, not very big, don't need all the army, just a simple process. But you know, something happened. They failed against that little city, and there were good men, good men who died because of that. Why? In Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1, it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the what? The accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. What was that accursed thing, friends? It was a, what was called a goodly Babylonish garment. There was something even about the clothing of Babylon that was attractive, and he wanted it selfishly. It appealed to his carnal mind, and the cost was the lives of 36 good men and the shame of God. Babylon was later the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. It was, meter for meter, the most glorious to the eye city ever built. We today think of cities like Paris, Rome, New York, uh, we, we think of these places as being glamorous or whatever. The friends, Babylon, Babylon stood head and shoulders above all of them for what it was. But one night, one night the Medes and the Persians came, and that was the beginning of the end. The city was step by step destroyed, and it has been uninhabited until this day. Men through the ages have considered trying to reestablish Babylon, but it cannot happen because it would be in defiance of God. In Great Controversy on page 381, we're told the term Babylon is derived from Babel and signifies confusion. It is employed in scripture to designate the various forms of what? False or apostate religion. Babylon is used in the scriptures to, to designate the various forms of false or apostate religion. And so in its most broad sense, if we could say, Babylon is used to represent every false religious system. We'll also find that it can have a restricted meaning, if you please. Now, let's just review a little bit, because to fully understand, appreciate the second angel's message, we have to have, again, a little bit of understanding, a good bit of understanding, actually, of the first angel's message. In that message, we see the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, the command to fear and reverence God, to give glory to him, to worship him as the creator on the Sabbath day. We also find acknowledgement of the beginning of the, just, of the judgment, the investigative judgment. In this message of the first angel, the giving of the judgment hour message began with Peter Miller and others, such as Charles Fitch and Josiah Litch in the United States, and was carried to all parts of the world. 
Now the second angel's message, and we heard just a little bit about the history of the first giving of the second angel's message this morning. But the second angel's message, friends, is God's reaction. And get this, the second angel's message is God's reaction to the people's reaction of the first angel's message. Did you get it? God's giving the second angel's message is his reaction to the way the people responded to the first angel's message. How thankful we should be as a people that we have an inspired account of the history of the giving of the first and second angel's messages. You know, in the United States, and maybe it's happening here, but in the United States, there is a great attempt to rewrite a lot of the history of our country. And they want to change the way people think about past people and events. And this is probably true, too, concerning the events of 1833 to 1844 and on. But friends, we have an inspired account through the prophets. And I'd like to share just a little bit of this with you. This is from Great Controversy, page 398. I've got this uh, particular paragraph broken in two parts. It says, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844. And it then had a more direct application to the churches of the United States, where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected, and where the declension of the churches in the churches had been most rapid. But the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of what? Their refusal of the light of the Advent message. But that fall was not complete at that time. That fall was not complete. It continues, as they continue to reject the spiritual truths for this time, they have fallen lower and lower. And yet, however, can it be said that Babylon has fallen because she has made all nations drink of the wine and the wrath of her fornication? She has not yet made all nations do this. Now, I'm going to be bringing up a principle probably tomorrow morning, but I'm going to just interject, introduce it quickly here. And so it's the principle of time and place. Ellen White says in the testimonies, I believe it's in first selected messages, page 57, that concerning the testimonies, Nothing is to be ignored. Nothing is to be set aside, but time and place must be considered. You know that very well there's a statement in the book, Great Controversy. She says the majority of God's people are, are still in Babylon, right? Right? She says. Will that be true after probation closes? Will it be true after probation closes? Friends, there will not be one of God's people in Babylon after probation closes. You see what I'm saying? When it says she has not made all nations do this yet, we can read this until probation closes. But friends, there's a time coming and soon soon when this will be very well fulfilled to our eyes. So just be watching for it because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. She continues. Those who rejected and opposed the light of the first angel's message lost the light of the second and could not be benefited by the power and glory which attended the message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Jesus turned from them with a frown, for they had slighted and rejected him. They weren't rejecting the preaching of Miller and others. They were rejecting Jesus. Now, interestingly, here we see that although the churches did not fall as low as they could fall, they fell far enough to be out of favor with God. Some people think that a church has to fall in every respect to be rejected of God. I hear people say all the time, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist church, it can't be rejected yet. God couldn't reject it yet. Why? We still keep the Sabbath. So we say. But this tells us that, friends, if we reject certain truths, and especially remember this, that the more you know, the more you're going to be held, held accountable for it says you can still fall out of favor with God. You know, usually when we think of Jesus, and especially if we're in a children's class, we think of Jesus as the sweet and lovely Jesus with a kind smile. But I want you to notice in this statement, it says Jesus turned from them 
with a big pearly white teeth smile with a frown. You ever imagine Jesus frowning? But that's what the testimony says. When we reject truth, friends, we reject Jesus. In the summer of 1844, the parable of the ten virgins containing the midnight cry was considered present truth. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Matthew 25, 6. The churches that had rejected the first angel's message were considered to be fallen. The churches that had rejected the first angel's message were to be considered fallen. But that first angel's message, friends, the great part of it involves the hour of God's judgment, the sanctuary message, the most holy place ministry of Christ, the final atonement. What if my church rejects that? What if my church says, I don't really believe that anymore? Will that church be in favor with God? Several years ago, and it is several years ago now, when I was a young minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, because I was for about two and a half years, I remember receiving a copy of Ministry Magazine, a particular copy of Ministry Magazine. Ministry Magazine is a magazine they publish for the ministers of our faith as well as others. And in it, there was an article written, and the article was entitled, Within the Veil, Within the Veil. And I thought, well, this is about the sanctuary. This should be really interesting. And as I read it, I was shocked. I was appalled because this article by one of our leading theologians was stating that there may not even be a two apartment sanctuary. Maybe all of heaven is the sanctuary. It was trying to destroy what we believed. And I remember as a young minister thinking, this isn't what we believe. This isn't what I read in the Bible. Great controversy doesn't support this. Why would, our, why would our church publish something like this? And so I went to the next minister's meeting with this magazine rolled up, you know, ready to talk to other ministers about it. And I tried to ask every minister in our conference if they had read the magazine, and if they did, what did they think of the message in it? And what I found was a great deal of indifference. Some of them had not read it. Some of them had read it and said, well, you know, what difference does it make? I really only found one minister that was greatly concerned out of about 30 ministers in our conference. But it was really a rejection of the first angel's message. In early writings on page 249, very many raised their voices to cry, behold, the bridegroom cometh, and left their brethren who did not love the appearing of Jesus and who would not suffer them to dwell upon his second coming. I saw Jesus turn his face from those who rejected and despised his coming, and then he bade angels lead his people out from among the unclean, lest they should be watched. Friends, if we, now think about this, if she calls the fallen churches unclean. It wasn't like where I'm looking out in the mud hole out because it's been raining. That's not the unclean she's talking about. And it says that Jesus had those people to be let out, lest they be defiled. Those who were obedient to the message stood out free and united. A holy light shone upon them. They renounced the world, sacrificed their earthly interests, gave up their earthly treasures, and directed their anxious gaze where? To heaven. Friends, Jesus sent angels to those who accepted the first angel's messages as they withdrew from those churches who did not accept the message. These believers then proclaimed the second angel's message, the message that your church has fallen might not seem like that kind of a heartwarming message that would attract people. But interestingly, that's exactly what happened. Notice here, again from early writings, page 238. Every part of the land, in every part of the land, light was given upon what? Second angel's message. And the cry melted the hearts of thousands. The message of Babylon is fallen, and it melted the hearts of people. It went from city to city, 
and from village to village until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. In many churches, the message was not permitted to be given, and a large company who had the living testimony left these fallen churches. A mighty work was accomplished by the midnight cry. The message was heart-searching, leading the believers to seek a living experience for themselves. They knew that they could not lean upon one another. You know, friends, these kind of scenes, they're being repeated today in many ways. I became acquainted with a, what you call an independent church one time. They claim to be a historic Seventh-day Adventist church. If you, if you, you know what I mean when I say a historic Seventh-day Adventist church. You know, they claim to be a historic group. And they invited me to come speak. And I don't think they fully understood who I was or what I believed. But I started to talk to them about our history. I said, today, instead of a sermon, we're going to have a history lesson. We're going to look at what the history of the teaching of God was among our pioneers. And so I started to share some scriptural verses about the Father. And I said, so at first I said, now here's what James White said about God. Here's what Uriah Smith said about God. Here's what Jane Andrews said about God. And they said these things about God because of these biblical verses. And we'd go through the verses. And then I said, now, here's what they believed about Jesus Christ, that he's the only begotten son of God. They didn't believe he was the second person of the Trinity. And here's why. And by the time I got to the Holy Spirit, and somebody here has a bell. There's a bell that we hear ringing sometimes. You hear that bell ringing? Well, there was someone who got up. In fact, it was the elder of the church that day. He got up and he started ringing the bell, <laughs> making noise. Like, in other words, your time is over. Shut up and sit down. And so I said, well, I can see my time is up. So I will, I will sit down. I will, you know, I'm in your house. I'm not going to try to run over it. Well, there was a little bit of a pulpit blow up. That man came to the front and he was mad. He was mad. I'm trying to look for one of these ladies that's got a dress or a, a drape that's as red as his face was. Maybe that one back there, pretty red. See some reds here. But he was just flushed red and he was upset. And he says, this is heresy. You shouldn't say this. This is wrong. He says, our pioneers did not believe those things. I said, well, I've got a book here full of quotations that proves that they said those things. Well, maybe Uriah Smith, but none of the others. I said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, the church was scheduled to have a fellowship dinner that day. We had a fellowship dinner, and it was the quietest, the quietest fellowship dinner I've ever sat in. Nobody dared say a word. But that church, which was growing and vibrant at that time, had over 100 members. Within a year, it was dissolved and gone. Within a year, it was gone. And I believe, friends, it's because they were rejecting the message. We might wonder, friends, again, about this message and how it could be seemingly so heartwarming to people. But when we understand this message further, when we understand it in its steps, we are going to appreciate it like you've never appreciated it before. Knowing that you have the approval of Jesus Christ in a way that you did not have before is one of the most wonderful experiences on this earth. The message of the second angel is to be repeated. In Revelation 18, we read these words. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. We have here a repeat of the second angel's message with some detail, with some detail. Now, it says that Babylon has fallen, has fallen, just like in Revelation 14, 8. But notice it also says it's become the habitation. What is a habitation? A dwelling place, a living place, a house, a home for, for who? Devils, devils. And it's a hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, what if someone told you that the devil himself and his top devils, his top imps, demons, decide to take up residence in your house today? And they weren't going to leave, and you couldn't get them to leave. Would you go home? Would you go home? Would you stay there? Would you live there? 
my, I, I'd get away from it as fast and far as I could, wouldn't you? But friends, these churches that have fallen, they are a place where the devil stays. And we think that we can go in and be friends and hobnob with them? Not at all. Not at all. Verse 3, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Thus, the substance of the second angel's message is again given to the world by that other angel who lightens the earth with his glory. And we're going to take, if we have time, two whole messages on just the fourth angel's message. But it says these messages all blend into what? One. And you'll find that sometimes when Ellen White is speaking of the first, second, and third angel's message, she will refer to it simply as the third angel's message. She puts them all together, but she'll call it simply the third angel's message. They blend into one. It says these messages all blend in one to come before the people in the closing days of this earth's history. All the world will be tested and all that have been in the darkness of error in regard to the Sabbath and the fourth commandment will understand the last message of mercy that is to be given. Now, do you believe that the last great test is on the Sabbath? I do. I mean, I think inspiration is clear on that. So why is this message about God so important? The test is on the Sabbath. Shouldn't we concentrate on the Sabbath? As I said this morning, friends, as we talked about this this morning, the greatest religious crisis that this earth will have ever experienced is still in the future, the near future. But it's going to involve the issue of the mark of the beast and the image of the beast. And there is going to be brought pressure against believers that has never been brought upon believers before. And it's only going to be people who know their God who are going to be strong and do exploits at that time. And if you do not know the Father and the Son at that time, friend, you're going to capitulate and you're going to give in. We will need that experience that knowing the Father and the Son alone can give us to stand for that test. In Selected Messages, Book 2, page 118. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from his sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues for her sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. But friends, that's a quotation from Revelation chapter 18, verses four and five. And this is what we call the fourth angel's message. But here she says it actually is an extension of the third angel's message. The purpose of the first angel's message was to separate the Christians from the world, and yet many chose the world over Jesus. And we read here in Spirit of Prophecy, volume four, page 231, it was to separate the church of Christ from the corrupting influence of the world that the first angel's message was given. But with the multitude, even of professed Christians, the tie which bound them to earth were the ties which bound them to earth were stronger than the attractions heavenward. They chose to listen to the voice of worldly wisdom and turned away from the heart searching message of truth. So there was a separation from the first angel's message. But you know, friends, the second angel's message has points of separation too. You know, when we say Babylon has fallen, and I'll come to this text in Isaiah in just a little bit. When we say that Babylon has fallen, we acknowledge, we acknowledge that God is right. But friends, if we are not willing to acknowledge that Babylon has fallen and all of Babylon has fallen or, and all that is Babylon is a part of Babylon, then we are rejecting the wisdom of God we're declaring that we know more about the matter, the matter than God does. 
Now, I want to go back and we'll start here on Isaiah. And we're going to talk a little bit more about ancient Babylon. Concerning ancient Babylon, God used Babylon. Specifically, he used King Nebuchadnezzar as an instrument of chastisement. But there was a time when God said that Babylon had exceeded her authority and judgment was set against her. God instructed Isaiah to set a watch. He says here in Isaiah 21, 5 and 6, prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise, ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, go set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. Verse 7 and 8. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed. And he cried, A lion, my lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime. And I am set in my war nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And in verse 9, and he answered and said, notice what he said, Babylon is fallen. Not just fallen, but is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he hath broken into the ground. Here we see, friends, these two horsemen represent the Medo-Persians. And Babylon is said to be fallen and all of its images are broken to the ground. But of course, mystic Babylon has idols too. And coming out of Babylon involves getting rid of all of our idols. I mentioned sometime earlier that I've been in, in Rome, I've seen the Colosseum, but I've also been in the Vatican, went through the Vatican Museum, toured the St. Peter's Basilica. You can see all kinds of idols you want there, tons and tons of idols. But friends, the truth is you don't have to go to Rome or you don't even have to go to Silver Springs, Maryland, because friends, there's an idol called the church. Did you get that? There's an idol called the church, and too many people have the church, what they call the church, as an idol. God tells us that he's going to break all these idols and cast them to the ground. I want you to notice what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 51, verses 7, 8, and 9. It says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. They made all the earth drunken, and the nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are what? They're mad. They're crazy. They have drunk the wine of Babylon. Babylon, though, is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her? Take balm for her pain, if so be she be, may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she would not, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go, every one unto his own country, for her judgment reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. That which hath been in the past, God requires in the future. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It says God would have healed Babylon if she had submitted to him. And in the time of 1844, if those protestant churches would have listened to the message of the first angel... God would have healed them. He would have used them. But it was their lack of faith. It was their rebellion that disqualified them to do the work of God. And here in this text, in Revelation chapter 17, we find that God's judgment is going to fall upon mystical Babylon because she's made all nations drink of her wine. And friends, this Babylon, this Babylon has daughters. Because she is a mother of harlots. Now, if you have a harlot, and she has a child. What name does the child take? She takes the name of the mother. There's no father around. So if the mother's name is Babylon, what is, are, the, are the children's names? They're Babylon too. They're Babylon too. Friends, this Babylon is not alone. She has daughters. And in the specific context of Revelation 18.4, the second angel's message, we find the application given by the Spirit of Prophecy in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, pages 232 and two, to 233. She says this. Again, the term Babylon, derived from Babel and signifying confusion, is applied in the scripture to the various forms of false or apostate religion. But the message announcing the fall of Babylon must apply. Did you get that? It must apply to some religious body that was once pure and has become corrupt. 
It cannot be the Romish church, which is here meant for that church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries. But how appropriate the figure as applied to the Protestant churches, all professing to derive their doctrines from the Bible, yet divided into almost innumerable sects. In Revelation 17, however, we now have a different application to Babylon, for here she is called the mother of harlots. Continuing in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. In Revelation 17, Babylon is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the scriptures as a symbol of a church. A virtuous woman represents what? A pure church, a vile woman, and what? Apostate church. Babylon is said to be a harlot, and the prophet beheld her drunken with the blood of saints and martyrs. The Babylon thus described represents whom? Rome, that apostate church, which has so cruelly persecuted the followers of Christ. But Babylon, the harlot, is the mother of daughters who follow her example of corruption. Now notice what it says. This is very important. Please notice the last three lines. Thus are represented those churches that cling to her doctrines and, tradition, and traditions of Rome and follow her worldly practices whose fall is announced in the second angel's message. Friends, if we today, if we adopt her doctrines, if we adopt her traditions, that message of the second angel can apply to us. Continuing in Great Controversy now, page 382 and 383. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and now here we have an addition that wasn't in Spirit Prophecy Volume 4. And follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. Friends, if we have changed our doctrines to become friends with the worldly churches that are already a part of Babylon, then that term Babylon must apply to us as well. What were the churches tested upon? Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. What were the churches tested upon in 1844? Remember, we are told this. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of the refusal of the light of the Advent message. At that time, at that time, had the Sabbath message been given? Have the Sabbath message been given yet? No, they weren't tested on the Sabbath message, were they? Although the Sabbath is to be the great test at the end of time. Neither was the truth about God preached, as many of those Advent preachers, such as William Miller, were Trinitarians. The sanctuary doctrine of Jesus in the most holy place was not understood. They weren't tested on that. In fact, one of the key components of the message, the identity of the sanctuary, was wrong. Were these churches tested on spiritualism in the form of the immortal soul? No. While, for instance, George Storrs began to preach the mortality of the soul in 1841 and convinced Charles Fitch early in 1844 of this truth, there was still great opposition to the teaching by William Miller, Josiah Litch, and others. And so we see that many of the doctrines that we consider to be foundational and that make up pillars of our faith today were not testing truths at that time. And this is significance. There's a reason I'm telling you this. The churches, however, they rejected the message about the second coming of Jesus and the midnight cry. And in that rejection of light, God held them accountable. So even though they did not fall to the lowest state at that time, they were rejected based upon the light that they had received. And so notice the principle. There's a principle here. They rejected advancing light because they did not have a love for the truth. And therefore, they were rejected. And today, friends, if we reject advancing life, we will be rejected too. In Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, again, page 233. So when men now despise, what time? Now. When men now despise the warnings which God in mercy sends them, his spirit after a time ceases to arouse conviction in their hearts. Let me just pause there for a minute. When the spirit is no longer working in your heart, what has happened? When the Spirit is no longer working in your heart, Brother Dan, what has happened? It's the unpardonable sin. We're out. It says, so when, 
So when man now despises the warning which God in his mercy sends him, his spirit after time ceases to rouse conviction in their hearts. God gives light to be cherished and obeyed, not to be despised or rejected. The light which he sends becomes darkness to those who disregard it. When the Spirit of God ceases to impress the truth upon the hearts of men, all hearing is vain, and all preaching also is vain. It's vain. Think about that. When the church has spurned the counsel of God by rejecting the Advent message, the Lord rejected them. Again, friends, they were not tested on the Sabbath or the sanctuary. They weren't tested on the day of the dead. They weren't tested on the truth about God. And yet, friends, we who have so much more knowledge, so much more to be accountable for, is God going to give us a different standard of test, a different standard of judgment? Is he going to judge us somehow more lenient when we have these great truths that they didn't have? And yet he rejected them and he's going to let us pass through? Of course not. Of course not. Proper attitude of truth is imperative if we wish to remain in favor with God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because, because they didn't understand the truth. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that they didn't understand the truth. It doesn't say they didn't have an opportunity to hear the truth. What it says is that they did not receive a what? Love of the truth. That they might be saved. Friends, we need to not only know the truth, we need to have a love of the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. Friends, the issue to us should not be if we're willing to obey the truth, but simply what is the truth and what we are to obey God and to love that truth because God is a God of truth. And Jesus is the truth. If we love the truth, we will be safe. He will guide us into all things if we do not love the truth and if we do not react properly to it. We indeed will be lost. We will be lost. I suppose a good thermometer a spiritual thermometer, if you please, a way to gauge our spiritual temperature with God is our attitude toward truth. You know, sometimes brethren come and they have some new ideas and we're so quick to, to shove them away. We don't listen. Jim, the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is what? Good. You know, today, friends, if someone can show me that I've, I've erred, if you can show me that I've spoken something that was wrong here today and show me a better way, I'll get right behind you tomorrow and we'll preach it tomorrow and I'll say I was wrong. And you know, if I say I'm wrong tomorrow, it just simply means that I'm more intelligent tomorrow than I am today. And there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Right? But friends, we better know what we're saying, especially those, those men of you who stand here in this position. Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 11, we speak that we do know. God does not give any of us as ministers or Sabbath school teachers or just as Home missionaries, people visiting your neighbor. He gives you no right to go out and speculate to the congregation or to your neighbor. You speak that which you know is true. Don't speculate. I know I have a little time left, but this is a good place to break this message. But tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about the first call to come out of Babylon. And it wasn't the midnight cry. It wasn't the midnight cry. But tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about the first call to come out of Babylon. But friends, tonight, we have a chance to come out of Babylon. Maybe we're not associated with any of these churches that today God considers part of Babylon. But friends, we can have Babylon in us, even if we're not physically in Babylon. Do you understand the difference? We can love the things of the world. We can love the things of Babylon. We can cherish those things in our hearts. We can, I mean, think about our educational systems. We can begin to train our children like the children of Babylon train, not only in content, but in method. We can, we, we can set up hospitals and we can treat people like Babylon treats people. And we may not be all the way out of Babylon yet. So I want to appeal to you tonight 
to take these things to heart, to ask God to help you, to show you where you don't need to come out of Babylon. I mean, I hope, and we may not be there, but I hope that we're all beyond the point of needing church membership in the Seventh-day Adventist corporate church. Because if any of you still have membership in, let me tell you something, there's a corporate accountability involved. You are part of that corpus of that body, and the sins of that body you are partly responsible for, and you need to understand that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together, to study your word, to see the inspired history of the giving of the second angel's message. We thank you, Father, that you are calling people out of Babylon today. It's a place that we don't need to be, we shouldn't want to be. It's the habitation of devils in a cage of every unclean, hateful bird. Father, help us to look for pure places, pure land, pure truth, and to have a love of the truth that we can be set free. Please bless thy people as we take this break and prepare later to come back for our evening meeting. Bless our speaker that we'll have later. Bless each one that's come in for the meeting. I pray, Father, that you will draw us closer to each other, closer to Jesus, closer to the truth, closer to heaven, ready for the soon coming of Jesus ready to stand in that great day that's coming ahead. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you. And for those folks who are on the uh, internet, thank you for being with us too. God bless.